is the fourth lecture of this five lecture series on acoustics. In this last lecture, we studied ultrasonic waves, methods of their production and their applications which are quite varied and cover many areas. In this lecture and the next one, we shall study acoustics of buildings. This deals with sound quality management in buildings and enclosed spaces. Sound quality management means adequate loudness, sound distribution, quality, clarity, optimum persistence, reverberation, absence of resonances and echoes and a check on unwanted sounds which is just a noise. In open air, the condition for hearing of a speech or music is that it must possess an adequate loudness to overcome extraneous noises or sounds. This is quite simple. On the other hand, in a closed hall or a room, the reflections, multi-reflections, resonance and persistence modified the sound quite a bit and may interfere with the auditory quality. Sometimes the speaker could hardly make his words intelligible to his audience. The acoustics of buildings has been developed in order to cope with the various inhibitory factors which may significantly interfere with the auditory sensation such as persistence control, noise insulation and reduction and sound distribution and absorption. The adequate knowledge of acoustics of buildings helps in purging out these interfering factors which will otherwise hamper the intelligibility of a speech, the freedom from external unwanted noises and the richness of music. In open air, sound is heard by the listener as direct waves from the source. When the source is shut off, an abrupt fall in the intensity of the sound is observed. When the source is inside a hall, multi-reflections at various surfaces do not allow abrupt fall in intensity and consequently, sound persists for a while, sometimes even quite a while after the source has ceased to function. This persistence of sound is called reverberation. The sound without reverberation is known as dead sound. The sound that reaches a listener in a fairly typical auditorium or a room can be classified into two broad categories, the direct sound and the indirect sound. This figure shows a listener receiving the primary or the direct sound, sound waves and indirect sound waves. The amount of acoustic energy reaching the listener's ears by any single reflected path will be less than that from the direct sound because the reflected path is longer than the direct source listener distance which results in greater divergence and hence a greater loss. In addition, all reflected sound undergoes an energy decrease due to the absorption of even the most ideal reflectors. But indirect sound that the listener hears comes not from a single reflected path, comes from a great number of reflected paths and consequently, contribution of reflected sound to the total intensity at the listener's ears can exceed the contribution of direct sound, particularly if the room surfaces are highly reflective. The phases and the amplitudes of the reflected waves are distributed randomly to the degree that cancellation from destructive interference is fairly negligible. The distribution of sound energy, whether originating from a single source or multiple sound sources in an enclosure, depends on the room size and geometry and on the combined effects of reflection, diffraction and absorption. Now, because of appreciable diffusion of sound waves due to all these effects, we no longer consider individual wave fronts 
no longer consider individual waves really. We consider um, what is called as a sound field. This is simply the regional region surrounding the source. In the region surrounding the source and close to it, the sound pattern is like that of an open space. This sound field close to the source is called the free field. From a point source, the sound waves will be a spherical and the intensity will approximate the inverse square law of variation. Neither reflection nor diffraction interferes with the waves emanating from the source. But because of the interaction of sound with the room boundaries and with objects within the room, the free field naturally will be of very limited extent. But if one is close to a sound source in a large room having considerably absorbent surfaces, the sound energy will be directly directed dominantly from the so sound source and not from the multiple reflections from the surroundings. A free field can be simulated throughout an entire enclosure if all of the surrounding surfaces are lined with almost totally absorbent materials. A diffuse field is set to occur when a large number of reflected or diffracted waves combine to render the sound energy uniform, that is important, uniform throughout the region under consideration. Sound reflected from the walls generates a reverberant field that is naturally time dependent. When the source suddenly ceases, the sound field persists for a finite interval as a result of multiple reflections and the low velocity of sound propagation. This residual acoustic energy constitutes the reverberant sound field. If a sound source is operated continuously, the acoustic intensity builds up in time and a maximum is reached. If the room is totally absorbent, so that there are no reflections, the room operates as an anechoic chamber which simulates a free field condition. Anechoic means echoless. A detailed study of auditorium acoustics was first done by W. C. Sabine long back in 1911. He laid down the following essential features for an acoustically good music hall auditorium or a lecture room. Number one, the sound heard must be sufficiently loud in every part of the hall, every part of the hall and no echoes should be present. Number two, the total quality of the speech or music must remain unchanged. That is the relative intensities of the various components of a complex sound must be maintained. Number three, for the sake of clarity, successive syllables spoken must be clear and distinct. There must be no confusion due to overlapping of syllables. Number four, the reverberation, which is persistence of audible sound in the room after the source is stopped, should be quite proper, neither too large nor too small. Let us spend some time on reverberation and its effects. This is very important in managing acoustics of buildings. Consider sound source that operates continuously until the maximum acoustic energy in the enclosed space is reached. Now suppose the source is suddenly switched off. The reception of sound from the direct ray path ceases after a time interval r by v where R represents the distance between the source and the reception point and V is the sound propagation velocity. But owing to the longer distance travelled, the reflected waves continue to be heard as a reverberation that exists as a succession of randomly scattered waves of gradually decreasing intensity. The presence of reverberation tends to mask the immediate perception of newly arrived direct sound unless the reverberation drops 5 to 10 decibels below its initial level in a sufficiently short time. 
reverberation time t that time in seconds required for the intensity to drop by 60 decibels offers a direct measure of the persistence of reverberation. A short reverberation time is obviously necessary to minimize the masking effects of echoes, so that the speech can be readily understood. However, an extremely short reverberation time tends to make the music sound harsher or less musical, while excessive values of reverberation time t can blur the distinction between individual notes. Number 5. The time t reverberation time also depends upon the size of the hall, loudness of the sound and upon the kind of music or sound for which the hall is to be used. The choice of t therefore, represents an optimization between two extremes. Sabine defin defined reverberation time t as the number of seconds required after the source has stopped to emit sound for the intensity of the sound to drop from a level of audibility 60 decibels above the threshold of hearing to the threshold of audibility. For a sound of frequency about 500 vibrations per second, the best time of reverberation is found to be about 1 to 1.5 seconds for hall of capacity 50,000 cubic feet and 1.5 to 2 seconds for a hall of capacity 400,000 cubic feet. Number 6. There should be no concentration of sound in any part of the hall. This means focusing should be avoided. Number 7. The boundaries should be sufficiently soundproof to exclude extraneous noise that is the sound coming from unwanted sound coming from outside. Number 8, there should be no echelon effect, we shall come to this later on. There should be no resonance within the building. Now, these are all the points which Sabine made. Now, the original Sabine relation for the reverberation time is t is equal to 0 0.049 v upon summation over s i alpha i. This is the relation is quite simple. Here v is the room volume in cubic feet, s is the component surface area in square feet and alpha is the corresponding absorption coefficient. However, this relation is a simple relation, this does not include effects such as interference or diffraction or behavior of sound waves as affected by the shape of the room, presence of standing waves and normal modes of vibration. And it is assumed that the sound intensity distribution in the room is uniform. Let us drive Sabine's formula. Sound energy emanating from a source in an enclosure after being reflected and refracted several times gradually increases in intensity and the distribution of energy at any instant can be taken to be uniform. As pointed out earlier, we no longer consider individual wavefronts, but refer to a sound field. This sound field is a diffuse field. This figure shows how diffusion results from multiple reflections from the walls of the hall. The degree of diffusivity will be increased if the room surfaces are not parallel, so that there is no preferred direction for sound propagation. Convex surfaces will augment diffusion. Multiple speakers also help in achieving better diffusion. Now, let E be the energy density of the diffuse sound field at any instant t, we shall first calculate the rate at which the energy is incident upon the walls and other surfaces and hence the rate at which it is being absorbed. Consider reception of sound energy by the elementary area d s of a plain wall of the enclosure as shown in the figure. This figure shows 
an elementary area d s normal to z axis, it is surrounded by a hemispherical shell full of sound energy, diffuse sound energy. Further, consider an elementary volume d v, we are using a spherical polar coordinates. So, d v is equal to r square sin theta d theta d phi d r on the hemispherical shell at a distance r, r is the radius of the shell at an angle theta with the normal to the elementary surface. The acoustic energy present within this elementary volume d v is E into d v which is equal to E into r square sin theta d theta d phi d r. This sound energy is traveling from this element equally in all directions as the sound field is diffuse. The energy traveling per unit solid angle along any direction is E r square sin theta d theta d phi d r divided by 4 pi which is the solid angle surrounding a point, but the solid angle subtended by the area d s at this elementary volume is d s cos theta upon r square and therefore, the energy in the elementary volume that is traveling towards d s is given by E r square sin theta d theta d phi upon d phi d r upon 4 pi multiplied by d s cos theta upon r square, r square cancels out. So, this is equal to E d s upon 4 pi times sin theta cos theta d theta d phi d r. Now, the total energy received in one second by the area d s is the energy confined in an hemisphere of radius v which is the speed distance traveled by the wave per second. It can be found by integrating the above expression with respect to theta phi and r respectively where theta varies from 0 to pi by 2, phi varies from 0 to 2 pi and r from 0 to v. Therefore, the energy received in one second by the area d s is E d s upon 4 pi integral from 0 to pi by 2 of sin theta cos theta d theta integral 0 to 2 pi of d phi integral 0 to v of d r and this gives E v d s upon 4. The intensity of such diffuse sound at the walls is therefore, E v upon 4. Now, all materials constituting the boundaries of an enclosure will absorb sound and reflect sound. Absorption occurs as the result of incident sound penetrating and becoming entrapped in the absorbing material, thereby losing its vibrational energy which converts into heat through friction. If alpha is the absorption coefficient, then a fraction alpha of the incident energy is absorbed and the balance 1 minus alpha is reflected. The value of the absorption coefficient will vary with frequency of the incident sound waves and the angle of incidence. Materials comprising room surfaces are subject to sound waves which impinge upon them from many different angles as a result of multiple reflections. The absorption effects are therefore, usually considered for random incidence. Ordinarily, the values of alpha should fall between 0 for perfect reflector and unity for a perfect absorber. Measurements of alpha greater than 1 have also been reported owing possibly to diffraction at low frequencies. Now, if alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 etcetera denote the absorption coefficients of different materials of corresponding areas S 1, S 2, S 3, S like this forming the interior boundary planes, walls, ceiling, floor etcetera 
as well as any other absorbing surfaces, furniture, debris, audience. Then the average absorption coefficient alpha bar for an enclosure is defined by alpha bar is equal to in the numerator we have a individual contributions alpha 1 into s 1 plus alpha 2 into s 2 plus alpha 3 into s 3 like this divided by the total area s 1 plus s 2 plus s 3. So, this is equal to a a is the total effective absorption area divided by s which is the total spatial area. So, alpha bar is a by s. Now, we can calculate the rate at which the sound energy is being absorbed by all these surfaces it is given by E v by 4 which was the intensity of the sound incident on the wall on the absorbers multiply by all this contribution. The result therefore, is this is equal to E v by 4 times a a is the total sound absorption of the enclosure as defined above. Now, we can consider the growth of sound energy. The total acoustic energy in enclosure of volume V at any instant is E into V, E is the energy per unit volume multiplied by the volume V. Its rate of change is naturally V times d by d t. Now, if p is the power output of the source place inside the chamber, then the rate of energy supplied by the source naturally in equilibrium this will be equal to the rate of rise in the acoustic energy plus absorption of energy at the walls that is P is equal to V times d by d t plus E v by 4 times a. So, we solve it for d by d t which is equal to 1 by v times p minus v a upon 4 times e that is we can it is now we want to actually integrate this expression. So, we write it like this d e upon p minus v a by 4 times e and this is equal to d t by capital V. On integration this equation gives minus 4 upon V a times log of p minus V a by 4 times e and this is equal to t by v plus the integration constant c 1. The initial conditions are initially t is equal to 0 no sound. So, e is also equal to 0 initially and that gives c 1 is equal to minus 4 upon V a times log of p. If we use this value now rearrange the terms and the result e is e is equal to 4 p upon v a times 1 minus exponential of minus v a upon 4 v times t. This is the final expression for the growth of sound in a chamber. This figure shows this growth. It is like charging of a condenser connected to a fixed voltage source through some resistance. Let us now consider a decay of sound energy. If the sound source is shut off and the time is measured from the instant of shutting off the source, the basic rate of growth equation now reduces to d by d t is equal to minus V a upon 4 capital V. Remember a small v is the speed capital V is the volume times e. On integration with the initial conditions that at e is equal to 0 initially that is that t is equal to t 0 or in t is equal to 0 and this gives log of e is equal to minus v a upon 4 v times t plus log of e 0 which on integration leads to e is equal to e naught exponential of minus v a upon 4 v times t. This equation governs the decay of sound once the source is shut off. This figure shows the variation of sound intensity with time. It is like the decay of the charge on a condenser through some resistance once the condenser is cut off from the battery. 
Now, the decay rate in decibels per second is given by d is equal to 10 upon 2.3026 times V a upon 4 V, which is equal to 1.087 times V a upon capital V. The reverberation time by definition, which is defined as the time interval during which the energy density falls from its steady state value to this value or a 60 decibel drop. Thus, if T is the reverberation time, then E upon E naught is equal to 10 raised to the power minus 6, which is the value of the exponential minus V A upon 4 V times capital T. So, this can be solved for T and the uh, result is that T is equal to 4 V upon V A into 6 into 2.3026. There were, there were, this time T may also be written in terms of decibel decay rate d. In that case, this t is given by 60 by d, which is equal to 55.2 v upon a times v. Remember again, capital V is the volume, small v is the speed, a is the total absorption in the enclosure. Thus, finally, t is equal to 0 0.161 v upon a taking the speed as 343 meters per second and expressing V in cubic meters and the area S in meters square. The above relation becomes T is equal to point not 0.49 V over A in English units where V is now is in cubic feet a is in square feet and the speed of sound is 1 1 to 5 feet per second. This is the Sabine's relation for the reverberation time and this we have come to the end of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.